Uh, so we were sitting in Hack Night last night and realized that uh, we had 28 slides and we have a 40 minute slot. Um, so we agreed as a group that we are going to tear through this as fast as we possibly can. Um, so uh, a lot of the stuff that we might have put on slides we put in here. So if you want information about how big the school is, Eastern Michigan's a regional campus. We're based in Ypsilanti. There's a little map there so you can see where we are. We're seven miles east of Ann Arbor. Um, so we're in the shadow of University of Michigan. Um, there are some really nice pictures of our campus. Um, and then on this right hand side, we've got some statistics about the scope of our online and web enhanced and hybrid classes. Uh, so that can kind of tell you, we run about uh, six or 7,000, uh, excuse me, about 23 or 2,400 uh, online sections each semester during fall and winter, and about 350 of them are online. Um, so eCollege, we've been an eCollege campus since 1998 before they were acquired by Pearson, um, and before they turned eCollege into Learning Studio. Okay, and we've re-upped with them for several different contracts. The last one was uh, in 2009 to 2015. Actually, I think it went 2010 to 2015. Um, and it was near the end of that contract that we had a conversation at the institution, what are we gonna do with the re-up? Um, and uh, we're dissatisfied with a lot of things going on with eCollege. Uh, the biggest thing that people talked about is that um, Pearson didn't seem to be investing in eCollege and it didn't seem to be uh, kind of pointed towards the future of where technologies were going and integrating with other applications and things like that. Um, so when the uh, keynote that we just had talked about Canvas being uh, an application that is oriented towards the future, that really rang a bell with me, because uh, that's why we chose it. So we started an implementation process in 200, 2014 to decide what we were going to do, uh, and, and eventually chose e or Canvas for the reasons that I talked about. Um, now I wanted to ask really quickly, um, I was curious who was gonna be coming to this room because Pearson just announced this year that they were going to shutter eCollege in 2018. Um, how many people are, uh, uh, you have a quick question? Okay, interesting news. Okay, uh, so how many folks are, are, are Pearson eCollege or Learning Studio clients? Okay, so you're already here kind of looking at Canvas and coming, that's pretty neat. How many folks are in structure, CSMs and implementation people who might be working on those things? Okay, I thought there might be a lot of folks like that. So we're gonna talk about uh, not our decision process but our migration process in this project. And so to give you a kind of a high level summary, um, uh, for our migration project, um, we set out to accomplish a high level of process automation. We have a lot of processes that are automated in our campus, especially because of some unique uh, characteristics, one of which is that um, our faculty have the right to refuse to let their content be used by other people every time it's used. It's part of our faculty contract. So we have to track who's got what content, and we can't let faculty copy their own content from their previous courses because it actually may have come from a colleague. Um, so that means that our instructional designers are actually specifying every time a course is created. So faculty request a course every time. So we've got an intranet system that we do in SQL Server database that we had that was going to eCollege to do course creation as well as the enrollment bridge. And we had to reproduce all of that automation. Uh, second thing we wanted to do was have a large scale migration on demand. The main faculty concern that came over was that they wanted all of their content. Um, that was in our RFP for all of the vendors. Canvas responded to that really well. It was another reason that we selected them. Uh, and then the third uh, thing we needed was, uh, we needed to quick start a high percentage of instructors, uh, instructors prior to the launch. So we needed to train a whole bunch of people. And we're gonna talk about those projects. Uh, so we're gonna cover that now. We're gonna talk about the enterprise processes. We're gonna talk about the migration project. And we're gonna talk about training and instructional design support. So let me hand this over. Oh. Quick timeline that you'll see in here. This is on the inside. Um, so 2014, we made the decision to go to eCollege. In the fall of 2014, we started a pilot uh, with 15 courses, very small. Uh, the next winter, we went up to about 93 courses. So we got more experience with the faculty and what their concerns were. And then we went fully live in the summer of 2015. That was with about, I can't remember, five or six, maybe 700 courses. And then the following fall, we went live with everybody. So we've been live on the system for about a full year with that. Okay, and we'll cover the, those other aspects as we go through them. I'm gonna hand off to Andrew now to talk about automation. 
All right. So um, there are a lot of processes that I walked into um, because we were in e-college for 15 years. I just only three years at the university. And so a lot of things like uh, shell creation, automatic enrollment, and online ev course evaluations were uh, pretty much a high momentum processes that had a lot of uh, a lot of structure, and by moving on to a new system, we had to more or less uh, recreate them. So in summary, we had to uh, see how Pearson and, uh, and structure, we, we combined, or I'm sorry, we compared the two processes for that, and we processing as well, and um, online course evaluation. Our e-college instance on um, Pearson was supporting that internally, on structure didn't, so we actually had to uh, use a vendor for that. Going into a bit more detail, just for uh, sake of comparison, in e-college, we did a lot of things with FTP. Uh, course copy history was pulled from reports on a daily or, or uh, even hourly basis. The uh, SIS data was from our intranet system. We had to combine and select, and that was a part of the course show creation uh, request process from our instructors. And then we processed it all, put in a, uh, a comma, I'm sorry, a tab delimited file and upload it to the FTP. Uh, structure was a lot more modern with API, so we uh, had to pull some reports from the API, uh, match that with our SIS data, uh, combine and process into a table instead of on the uh, on the CSV right there, and then send each request via the courses API. So essentially, one was more bulk, one was uh, more specific. Uh, some of the fields that overlapped, there were many that didn't, so we had to really reorient our, our, our thinking process. Uh, the ones that matter, like the course ID and the course call number, that was pretty sta uh, stable. Display course code is now our short name, the uh, Canvas account, and uh, the terms, that was pretty much the same. Everything else uh, wasn't. We, we couldn't keep some of those fields from eCollege that were very instrumental in tracking uh, the instructor's content from one term to another. Um, but we have uh, built in, in our process a new way to, to handle that. From uh, user creation and course enrollment, this was pretty good. Um, in eCollege, users were created and enrolled at the same time. They didn't have to have a separate file. Uh, and once again, we uploaded that via the FTP. In Canvas, we have to have two separate processes, once again, leveraging the APIs, one to create all the users and two to uh, match their enrollment in the SIS to wherever they need to be in Canvas and send those via SIS uploads through their API. Once again, looking at the files real quick, there should be a lot of overlap. I mean, a user is a user, but um, you'll see one had all the fields in one file, whereas Canvas had two, so it's just broken up right there. Roles, names, stuff like that. Online course evaluation. Uh, simply, Pearson did a, a, a pretty good job for what we needed at the time, um, but the online course evaluations were implemented in such a way where the student went into the LMS, they were more or less um, prompted to fill out their course evaluation, so the uh, response rate was pretty high because they couldn't get to their work without doing that, whereas uh, in Canvas we uh, use the evaluation kit to try to do something a bit similar. Uh, we can't have that obstruction, so we send them uh, numerous communications through email. Um, it's it's pretty it's it's a pretty good process. It's it's a completely different approach, but um, because of the nature of the university, every um, subject code has to have their own individual evaluation. So it takes uh, it takes matching them on the it takes matching them in eval eval kit um, session versus through eCollege, which was pretty much integrated. That's the dashboard. This was internal. This was the uh, LTI that we put together. And I believe, uh, in summary, some of our vital connections, uploads, and endpoints were uh, the FTP bridge, the UI-based uh, CSV upload, a lot of the basic reporting, and our enterprise reporting, which is somewhat similar to the Canvas data, but not necessarily. Th those were our e-college uh, tools. In Canvas, we maybe used some UI-based uploads. That was early on, early on in a pilot. But these days, we leverage as many API endpoints as possible for course uploads, for enrollments, for co content copying, all the above. 
At this point, we're going to talk migration. I'll hand this back to Bill. So the migration project, since we'd been in Pearson since 1998, uh, when we counted it up in our report that came down, we had over 65,000 core shells, okay? Uh, and those are uh, for live courses, for non-academic courses, and so forth. Um, if you know about Pearson E-College Learning Studio, one of the problems with it is that it doesn't have any industry standard export. Uh, and this was something that we asked them about in 2009. Uh, they actually agreed to add a clause to our contract then saying they would give us some kind of an export if we chose to leave at the end of that five-year contract, okay? So we had some kind of guarantee that they would have that, but we didn't know what it was going to be. And Pearson's, um, uh, their rationale for this had always been that all of our courses were always available uh, when everyone want, wanted to go back and get something, and that was true, okay? Um, so we had never lost content before with their system, okay? Um, Another thing that we had to reproduce was the content uh, tracking requirements that I mentioned. So if faculty member A had actually created the course and then it had come to faculty member B, uh, three semesters later we still had to be able to go back and make sure that we knew where that course originally came from so we could get permission, okay? Um, I also mentioned that this was a faculty priority. Um, so we got asked again and again about bringing all of my courses over and so that was uh, made it a problem that we knew we needed to solve. Um, so, our Canvas migration proposal, okay, uh, when Canvas came and responded to our RFP, they actually had the best response about um, bringing courses over. They had already created a screen scraping based program that would get content um, off of eCollege, um, and they agreed to do, that. part of it was that they would do the customization needed to get it off of your, of your instance. So, what to migrate, okay? Uh, we utilized our eCollege course offering report. This is one of those um, FTP-based reports that Andrew was talking about that had a list of all of our eCollege courses. And in the fall, when we started the project, if you look at the timeline, it's the PG1 and PG2 and PG3 batches of courses. Uh, what we did was draw off of that report and we produced lists of online courses and web-enhanced hybrid courses um, to go ahead and migrate. And we had a criteria that for the online courses, we'd have at least one copy, the latest one, of each course title for each faculty member that they had taught once in the last three years. Uh, that was about 750 courses. And then for the Web Enhanced and Hybrid, we had the same thing, one copy of each title for each faculty member that they taught at least twice in the last three years. And that came out to about 3,400, or yeah, 3,400. Um, so that came out to a very large number of courses that we handed off to Canvas to start migrating in the fall. Those courses started to come back in December uh, and uh, January during that uh, fall and winter semester, okay? Um, the process uh, that we followed um, was that uh, we would have to create, we created a copy of every course that we wanted to migrate in eCollege, okay? And when we went to Canvas, we had to give them the unique ID number that Pearson used for that course. So we would create all of these copies in one term. We would run our report to get all those ID numbers out. Then we would go over to Canvas and we would create a shell for that content to be received in. And then we created one table that had all of those numbers match up. And we put that in Google Docs. And then the professional services team would take out that table and they would feed it into their screen scraping program. And the screen scraping program ran like a, 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 like a box. Basically they put an entire list of courses to be copied into the hopper and then they would have to let it run and they really didn't know what the outcome was gonna be until they got it done. During this entire process, it came down to probably about a 3% failure rate uh, for courses. And we attributed a lot of that to all of the junk that people had put into the eCollege courses. I mean, we had some that came out that had 500 megabytes of data. They had video files and stuff students had submitted and so forth. Um, so there was going to be something like that that we had to cover. Okay. Um, I mentioned after we did those first three batches, then we opened it up for instructors to request courses. And we had a form on the web that fed into a database. And so we had a, probably another 2,000 requests. All told, we had about 55 or 5,600 courses that we submitted uh, to come over for migration. Uh, and they came back to us through the winter and into the spring, and we returned to them to the faculty members. So the migration distribution. 
Um, so uh, the, the status for all of these migrations, what we got back from, e from Canvas, they would put back into that Google Sheet, we would put it back into our database, and one of the things we did was send email updates to the instructors a few different times, probably every two months during the process to let them know, you've requested seven different courses, uh, here's the status, four of them have already been returned, three of them are still pending. And that helped to uh, let people know the status of their requests so that there was a lot less anxiety about courses coming back. Um, after that, we did manual migrations as needed, and Matt will talk a little bit about that process and what it took during the summer and the, and the, and the following months. So a couple of the things we did with Pearson. Um, early on in 2014, we had what we called a Skunk Works project because we weren't sure what Pearson was going to come up with. Um, and so what we tried to do was use their APIs um, to see if we could download content. And there were actually um, some Pearson clients who, Pearson produced a pretty complete set of APIs for the system. And there were a few clients, I think one of them was DeVry University, who had created their own user interface uh, for Pearson that's uh, basically to replace the one that they shared with Learning Studio. And actually that was one of the first things that began to concern us about Pearson because it seemed like they were unbundling their stack and selling off parts of it uh, because they weren't willing to invest in renewing the user interface. Um, so we were going to try to use this to download everything. That turned out to be a gargantuan project. It was just me and Andrew working on it, and so we had to drop it. We did use it to download all of the syllabi from thousands of courses as a backup, you know, if we needed that. Um, Pearson gave us access to an archiving tool. This is the way they satisfied the provision in the contract. Turns out that their archiving tool was actually um, a tool that they had created in-house in order to migrate content from Learning Studio to their learning object repository product. And so it was never intended to be shared with customers. Well, they opened it up to us, um, and it had a very clunky user interface to go and request um, the archive. The archive itself was actually very good. You got a nice zip file, it was well organized, had all the content, but the download was HTTP. And so we tried to use this to download about two or 300 courses that we had fail in the migration, and most of them we were never able to download because they would break when you were trying to do it. You, you would sit there for hours churning trying to download a large file. So that turned out to not be an option. Um, Gradebook and evaluation archiving, this is important for uh, the campus. Uh, we did a number of different downloads of the gradebook. Um, we actually created an interface and had student workers downloads those as Excel files so that if faculty came back to us, uh, we would be able to produce those. Um, we also exported a lot of um, uh, evaluations from the enterprise reporting product, so we had multiple copies of that as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, our registrar came in at the last minute and said that they needed our um, historical information for the last date of student activity in a class for financial aid. We were able to get that out of enterprise reporting too. It took a few weeks for somebody working on that to be able to extract it. So those are other aspects of the project for getting off of Pearson. Um, so migration support structure, I think it's just your slide to move to. Okay. Matt's gonna take over next and talk about the instructional designers picking up from where the process had left off. All right, hope. I'm just gonna do this. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I've exhausted all of my social interaction batteries, so if I um and uh, please forgive me. Um, so the point of the next set of slides that you're gonna see is basically that even with, peers, uh, even with instructors and excellent professional migration services, there's a lot of instructional design work to do, and there are a lot of adjustments you need to make in your instructional design approaches. So we're gonna talk a lot about that. Um, we're first gonna talk about the fact that one of the advantages we had was the ability to be pretty flexible in scaling our staff support for this migration. Um, so we have three full-time instructional designers on staff. We brought in three full-time temporary instructional designers. They weren't, uh, all three of them weren't there for the duration of the entire migration project. So if you check your migration timeline on the handout, you can see when we had those people as well as an estimate of staffing hours. Uh, we have three part-time student workers and we have our CMS coordinator, Andrew, and you can see, again, the total number of courses migrated and the 450 courses beneath that that we manually migrated. That was the bulk of the migration work. It was pretty monstrous. Um, I'm not expecting you to read all of these right now, and I am not going to read them all to you. The point of this slide is to demonstrate that with pretty much every kind of content that you have in eCollege or in any other LMS, when it comes over to Canvas with their professional migration services, you're gonna have to touch it. 
That means an instructional designer is going to have to get in there and clean it up. Or in the case of faculty members who have never used Canvas before, that means that you're going to have to have an instructional designer train them on how to do that. Um, this was complicated by the fact that, well, there's a lot of different kinds of content that have these issues. So um, we saw all sorts of problems. Uh, the biggest problem we saw had to do with the way eCollege handled file linking and the way Canvas handles file linking. So if you're familiar with eCollege, you know that in older iterations of eCollege courses, that would be the legacy or AU format, you had static links that linked directly to an instance of a course shell rather than dynamic links that just linked to whatever course shell this link happens to appear in. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of those old link styles that are static links to particular course shells lurking around in pretty much all eCollege content. I'm not sure whether that's the case with other course management systems, but it's something to, be, uh, something to consider as you embark upon this process. So a lot of the things that you see here actually have to do with that particular issue. Um, other than that, though, there are some weirdnesses in terms of the way Canvas handles gradable items and eCollege handles gradable items, some discrepancy be discrepancies between the two that always have to be manually corrected. And in some cases, you have to find creative solutions to do that, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. Um, but this is a good overview of the types of problems that we had, the types of issues we ran, we ran into, and you'll want to uh, grab the PowerPoint if you want to get that full list. Um, this is a bird's eye view of the amount of instructional design work required for every single course that came over. 10% of the courses that we got back from the professional services migration required five to 10 hours, or in some cases even more, of instructional design work to make ready for deployment in Canvas. That's a mountain of work. Um, and I want to stress that the professional services from, from Instructure were excellent. Everything came over. It's just that when you're coming from another, a completely different system that does things in a completely different way, you have to completely redo everything. So you're going to get all your content there. You're not going to have to reload it. In a lot of cases, it's going to look pretty decent. But you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to check every link. You're going to have to re-embed every video. You're going to have to redesign every single assignment. And uh, in certain cases, like with extra credit and things like that, you're going to have to come up with new and creative solutions to provide that functionality in Canvas because the way eCollege did it and the way Canvas does it are so, so different. Um, so as you go down that list there, you can see that it drops off pretty quick. So the bulk of the courses took maybe two to four hours. And we did, did most of that with instructional designers and with student workers. So an instructional designer would review every course. Um, we'd pass that work off to student workers, and they do the majority of the grunt work, correcting links, re-embedding videos, and do, doing all that kind of thing. And an instructional designer would look over it again. And then uh, other courses, and th the bottom two rows here are principally uh, what we call web-enhanced courses. That just means a, shell for a uh, course shell for a face-to-face -face course rather than a fully online course. Those required a lot less work because they had a lot less content. Um, so uh, adjusting, a in, excuse me, adjusting instructional design approaches in terms of course organization. So if you're familiar with both systems, you know that eCollege uses a content organization uh, theory in the left-hand navigation, and Canvas uses a function organization methodology in the, in the left-hand navigation. So what this means is all of your content is going to come over in a way that uh, is not familiar to instructors who are used to eCollege. Um, it's going to be kind of all blown up and all over the place. It's going to be in pages. It's going to be in modules. It's going to be, um, if they're, they're looking on the left-hand side, they're not going to see it. They're not going to see that structure that they're used to. When it comes over from the professional services, uh, it does have a module structure and appears in the modules area. So one of the first things you want to do is direct people, if they're looking for that left-hand navigation, ecology, uh, content organization, click on modules. We had a lot of instructors who would like freak out and be like, where is everything? Why is this so different? And it's like, click on modules. And they're like, oh, huge sigh of relief. So <laughs> there's one thing you take away from this, it's that. Um, so as far as course organization goes, that, that is one thing we pushed, module-based module -based development. Um, we've always, uh, from an instructional design standpoint, we've always focused on what we call rapid unit development. That translated well into the modules view in Canvas. So we've always um, taken a perspective in the development of fully online courses, and in some cases in um, bulky hybrid or face-to-face -face courses of saying, let's develop two or three uh, weighty modules in the middle of the course get a framework going, and then deploy that to the rest of the course. And either the instructional designers will do that, or the instructors will take the lead and meet whatever standard we set for them and you know, build to the standard that we design. Um, so that's, uh, this was a good opportunity 
even though it wasn't a huge change other than saying go to modules instead of thinking about this in terms of units and what appears on the left, click on modules and go there. This is a good opportunity to uh, highlight to our instructors that this is how we do instructional design at Eastern Michigan University. So it was sort of a resurgence in, in, uh, in, in so much as having an opportunity to deliver that message to them. Um, when it comes to assignments and how you set up the gradebook, um, I found that the best approach to training people on the shift from, can, uh, from e college to Canvas was to think, how would somebody ask me this question if they were trying to do this in e college? And how would I explain that to them how to do that in Canvas? So, what you see here on this table right here is e college terminology for how do I do these different things and what you actually do in Canvas to make that happen. So, in the case of how do I add points, that's going to become create a Canvas assignment. That's actually a really huge shift for people. If you're familiar with eCollege, eCollege allows you to build the gradebook out without, without actually ever building a graded assignment in the course. You're basically just putting in graded columns, but they have no links to any other objects in the course. They're just columns that appear in the gradebook and they can plug a grade in. So one thing that was like sort of hard for instructors to grasp was the fact that if I just want a grade column, I just want a field to put a grade in for this, I have to create an actual assignment that lives in Canvas. It has a presence somewhere else other than the gradebook. Um, this is something that we still are going around and around with, uh, in some cases with new instructors who've come from other LMSs, because it is a bit of a, a, bit of a shift in thinking. Um, and then there's some other examples here. So how do I add a gradebook column, create an assignment with no submission? So what that means is, how do I add a gradebook column typically means, how do I add a column for something that's either in class or just needs a gradebook presence but doesn't need a presence anywhere else in the course? That would be a no submission assignment in Canvas. How do I create a Dropbox? That's gonna be an assignment with a file upload type. How do I build my gradebook? The overarching question, you know, help me do my gradebook. Create assignments in the assignments area is the answer to that question. So the language is really different. Um, people had trouble with that. Um, moving on, so extra credits, a uh, bit of a shift. Um, and I just understand that the wise folks at Instructure are making some big changes, particularly, particularly in regard to quizzes uh, on how extra credit happens. Um, in eCollege, you could have extra credit questions in quizzes and exams. In Canvas, you, you can, but you have to do it in kind of a clever way. Uh, the, the bottom line here is, um, and I mean literally the bottom line here, um, in Canvas right now to create an extra, credit, uh, an extra credit question on a quiz, you have to put that question in, set the point value to it to zero, the student answers the question, the instructor goes into the speed grader after the fact and sets a point value uh, the, the points received for that question. So there's no way to, yeah? We found a very nice workaround. So if you take advantage of the group system inside of your assignments and set everything to 100%, you can then set an extra credit uh, as plus five, or move the extra credit assignment into whatever assignment category that they want to be weighted heavily. That's a, that's a good workaround. I think for us, um, well, one thing that comes to mind is would you, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, he said that he had, um, his group had uh, discovered a good way to, uh, to work around that particular caveat, and, and that was to use assignment groups and to move the, the extra credit thing that you want into that assignment group. Um, that works great if you're dealing with separate assignments. If you're dealing with like one or two questions on a quiz, would that work? That, I'd have to refer you to the uh, okay. Yeah, so th that's, the, that's the problem that we had, right? Like if you wanna add five points of extra credit on a quiz, how do you do that? Um, well, there's no way to do it in Canvas that we know of that uh, allows that to be graded automatically. The instructor always has to go in and grade that after the fact. So that's, that's a bit of a pain. Um, what's that? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna fly. Um, okay, so document sharing and files in general. So when you get your, uh, when you get your migrated courses back from uh, Pearson Professional Services, if you use them, all your files are gonna be in the files area. That includes all document sharing and files from the file manager in your eCollege course. They're all gonna be in one place. There's no set document sharing area in Canvas. Instead, um, you use the files area in a, in a particular way by creating a folder structure and then setting permissions for what students have access to in there. Um, I just wanna point out that you're, you're gonna to want to make sure that you stress to instructors the importance of setting up those permissions properly so that they have access to the things they should have access to and don't have access to the things you don't want them to have access to, like last term's exam key. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of sharing files with other students, um, in eCollege you could use the doc sharing area to allow students to upload files to share with other students. You can't do that in Canvas. 
one workaround that we found was to use discussions with the attach files to discussion responses option turned on. That will allow students to share files with one another. Um, but to, to wrap all that up, you're gonna be using in most cases the files area uh, to share files with students. At least that's how a lot of our instructors do it. It's just very important that those permissions be set properly. Inside your files area? Yeah, absolutely. It is possible to create a folder inside your files area and only give students access to that folder. So they can't share inside of that. You could use groups and the group homepage to do uh, file sharing in this way. We found that discussion, uh, a discussion with attached file to the discussion response tends to be a slightly um, easier method for instructors to, gasp, uh, to grasp. Um, thread discussions. So. Uh, one thing that was interesting about eCollege and that instructors really liked was the ability to nest threaded discussion topics under single thread discussion uh, objects. So you could put basically multiple discussions inside one discussion. You can't do that in Canvas. You have to break those out into separate discussion objects. Ordinarily, that wouldn't be a huge problem, except that if you're dealing with graded discussions, you're gonna have to break that point value up across those discussions and be creative with how you ex explain your grading to instructors so that they can account for that. Um, so what we've, there's, there's two ways you can go, go about it. You can put multiple topics in a single discussion prompt or you can create multiple discussions. Um, this is another one of those things that uh, from a training instructor standpoint, this is like one of the things that comes up most often. So that's why it's in this, in this stack. Um, this is just a quick overview of the differences between the content authoring tools available in what was the visual editor in eCollege and what is now the rich content editor in Canvas. Um, the point here is most of that functionality is the same and very familiar to people, but there are really cool third-party applications that you can add via the courses apps area that you can have buttons for inside that visual editor toolbar. So if, for example, you wanted a Panopto video, that's a little green icon right there, embedded right into that content block, you can simply press that button and select the presentation that you wanna import there. Um, there are different applications that have buttons that are available for this. Uh, so it's a good opportunity to encourage, encourage instructors to use more of those tools because this opens it up and makes it a lot simpler for them to do that. There's a button right there. You know, in the case of YouTube even, you know, it's, for a lot of people it's a little daunting to, to copy that embed code if you're coming from a system that requires you to do that. This allows them to press that button and enter either the URL or a search string for the YouTube video they want, plug that right into the content. Um, so for, uh, now we're gonna jump onto training instructors on how to use Canvas. So we did a huge training blitz. We trained about 800 faculty over the course of a year. Um, and we offered several different session formats. So I would say the bulk of our, our strictly speaking, instructional design and getting your course ready to run as a four credit section in Canvas training was done via one-on-one -on -one sessions. So we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions because that was easiest uh, the easiest format in which to explain the nuances that each individual instructor had with their, each, uh, with their individual content. We did a lot of group training sessions too though, and we had a lot of success, uh, a lot of success by offering those in person and online via GoToWebinar simultaneously. So every single training session that we ran throughout the entire migration process, we ran in person and ran online simultaneously and recorded every single session and made them available for people to watch later. So, all of the training was basically available anytime from anywhere. That was instrumental in reaching as many faculty as we did in the amount of time that we had to work with. Um, we've all, this, is, uh, this is the departmental and programmatic sessions is something that's come up more recently as we've expanded our use of the system. Um, but we have a number of departments and a number of programs that have specific needs. Uh, we often offered uh, departmental or programmatic sessions that would touch on their specific needs and the ways ca that Canvas could accommodate them. And finally, we had instructor-led sessions. These were uh, run by instructor, instructor trainers, and we use these as train-the-trainer sessions. So they would come, they would train us, and we'd invite faculty to attend those trainings. So we were sort of all getting trained together. That was a really cool experience because we got, all got to learn at the same time um, what, the, what the issues we might run into were and what some of these tricks and tools that, we, that, were, uh, that were new to us and unfamiliar were as we went along. <clears throat> so just to touch a little bit more on one-on-one -on -one instructional design and migrated course deployment training. So this averaged about two hours per session. And 
The uh, most important part of this is that each session generated at least two and a half hours, or about two and a half hours of instructional design work for the instructional designers. So as we go through the content with individual instructors for each course, there would be a bunch of things that we identified with the instructor that were actually um, things that an instructional designer should fix rather than asking the instru instructor to fix themselves. And part of that was because once an instructional designer did it, we had a model by which we could say, look at how we did it, this is how you should do it. So that proved to be uh, pretty beneficial for instructors and for instructional designers. Again, it was that sort of learning together thing. Uh, we also had a number of group training sessions. This is a breakdown of all the different sessions that we ran. These were the ones that were off offered via GoToWebinar and face-to-face. -face. So we had the Canvas Quick Start. This is a one-hour blitz through the Canvas system. It covered everything from notifications, conversations, all the way into basic course functionality. Not so much course design, but just how do you get up and running with Canvas as quickly as possible. We also had gradebook and grading. This was to respond to the need for a more in-depth session on the difference between how Canvas assignment wor assignments work and how eCollege assignments work and how that connects to the gradebook. We also had webinar tools in Adobe Connect. This was training on BigBlueButton and on Adobe Connect, which is a third-party product that we have integrated with Canvas. That's our primary web conferencing tool. Uh, we also had Build Your Canvas course. This was an in-person only session. It was an instructional designer-led training. And what we would do is we'd get together in a big computer lab. Everyone would come, they'd work on their course, and we'd have an instructional designer there to say, uh, to jump in and solve problems and help them think about course design. So these were two-hour sessions. Uh, we also had managing groups in Canvas. Um, groups, especially when you're coming from a system like eCollege, and I guess just period can be confusing sometimes. Uh, so we had sessions that were just devoted to what are group sets, what are groups, how do you do this, um, what are group home pages, and how do you link these to, to assignments, how does that work? And finally, we had lockdown browsers. Uh, that's lockdown browser. <laughs> so that's a respondents tool, third-party product that we use to uh, uh, enhance exam integrity. Uh, we have a specific training for that as well. And that's it. That's it. Uh, do we have a few minutes for questions? So I have a, I have a technical question to the end of what Ken was reading, which I, I was listening to later. But um, every training session is dialed. So we're from we're from our University of Iowa, which is close to Eau Claire, close to Purdue. So of your training dialed, which one was the most successful for your university? Was it online, in person, a combination of the two? It was a combination of the two. Is this is the microphone working? Uh, the question is what, uh, what training style was most successful? Um, so I think the thing that worked the best with the training was actually the GoToWebinar product because it's the web conferencing software, but it's got a registration page on the front of it. And the beauty of that was that it sends the participants a reminder one day and one hour before the session with a link inside. So we emphasize to people you can decide at the last moment whether you're going to come to the classroom or do it online. And we often had a third of, of faculty take it online. Um, so that was higher than we expected. Uh, and we thought it was successful in both ways because we had registrations, hundreds of them, up to 1,000, to be able to show to the administration and for the administration to be able to show back to faculty groups to say, hey, we have provided a lot of support. So that was helpful. Other question over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I suspect there are other people that are migrating from either Brightspace, Moodle, or Blackboard. Those experiences will be much different than this, in that they have kind of standards. We have a, we have a way to import those much more cleanly. The assignments are more cleanly and things of that sort. College has its own unique animal, and therefore your experience get a lot more cleanup than yours do. So I just wanted to draw that point. Oh, I think that's very true. Um, E-college, the change in the interface was the cause of a lot of the follow-up that we had to do with everybody on the courses. And then we created a new export or import option. Mm -hmm. We worked with E-college on that, so talk to them about that. Yeah, I'll say one more thing about the one-to-one -one experience. Any one-to-one -one experience, although it's very resource-intensive in terms of time, it's another chance to talk to instructors and talk with them about future projects and things that are making them anxious and uh, you know, one of the things I'll mention is that we thought that a lot, we thought the fall when we went fully online was going to be very difficult and we staffed up for that. Um, actually, the most, ang the most uh, load that we had for supporting instructors was at the beginning of the summer, and I think that's because the largest number of people had their first experience with, e with uh, Canvas during that time. 
and so by the time we got to October of our first full semester online with Canvas, we were busy, but it was almost quiet compared to what we expected. Uh, part of that is from the training and outreach. We felt very good about that. And we have to say part of it was the Canvas uh, interface. Um, when they talk about it being more usable and easier to learn, um, it really came through for us. So in the end, it was viewed as a very successful project on campus. So thank you very much. Good luck with your implementation projects, and have a good conference.